in our theater nerds welcome to the bright side home theater podcast the home theater podcast it's all about the experiences and this is the second bourbon tasting experience thank you very much ara thank you guys from svs ara why don't you take it away this is your baby you love doing this happy to be here steve and i are so excited to be doing this Thanks, Ira. Let's go. Oh, my pleasure. But first, let's welcome Nick Brown, VP of Marketing, and Smith Freeman. He's a Senior Director of Product Management at SVS Sound. Welcome to the show, guys. Hello. Thank Thanks you for having, having us. us Ara. It's a pleasure to be here. The only thing I uh, like better than audio is good bourbon. So this is very <laughs> exciting on many levels. Well, we're going to have that, which is great. And uh, the only bummer is, Steve, we couldn't get the bourbon to you, but... Before we started, I was suggesting that one day we all go to the UK and just do the show over in Steve's living room. That's it, or a local pub. That's fine. A local pub would even be better. (laughs) It could be like an iPhone, whatever it takes. (laughs) Yeah, whatever it takes. We could go to that pub in, uh, what was it, Um, uh, the soccer... um, thing on apple i forget uh the name of the show oh, all yeah, of a sudden yeah the, the, uh, ted, lasso? ted lasso ted lasso let's go to that pub yeah no worries. i was thinking go. more we'll find a, an english roadhouse you know we just had yeah. a new roadhouse released yesterday we'll just have something like that <laughs> and with all the blood and the fights going on around we'll do our show in the middle of it <laughs> yeah <laughs> did so, you watch it all right i yes i saw it last night yes uh, thumbs up <laughs> thumbs down conor mcgregor's the bad guy right he is the bad yes, guy. Yes, he is. He, he is. Um, do we give a sneak preview of Tuesday night, Deej? Let's Let's not, because uh, the oh. SVS guys have a hard out there. Look at uh. look at Nick. He's in the middle of a show right now. Look at the <laughs> backdrop. That's the backdrop we all dream of. <laughs> look at him. <laughs> so, so it's funny. We, I wish this was the actual room, but this is just a picture of the room that I was in about 10 minutes ago. Um, the show goes till 8 p.m. here in Montreal. They like to listen late, so... I snapped a shot, use it as my virtual background, but I will be nice. here all day tomorrow uh, flexing the muscle of this system. So I'm, I'm looking forward to that. Oh, that that's awesome. Uh, awesome. And, and you can talk to us a floor. little bit. <laughs> can you hear? I mean, it's not very loud, is it? The floor? No, uh, here in Montreal, no, I'm uh, way off in the corner in the sleeping rooms. If you walk down the halls, um, you know, these are high-end audio files. So they're, they're not playing at reference level. A lot of it's, you know, some classical and jazz. Uh, but, you know, you just walk down the hall and you'll hear, you know, yeah. five different genres of music. And, uh, you know, it's a true hi-fi show, two-channel all the way. But, you know, obviously we, we like to Very be the guilty cool. pleasure. So we have some, uh, some two-channel and some uh, multi-channel mixed in there as well. Very cool. Hey, Braden, let's, I'm uh, sorry, uh, DJ, let's start with our first bourbon for the, for the show. And it is an go. Elijah Craig toasted, Elijah Craig toasted barrel. This bourbon was very hard to find when it first came out, but you can kind of find it almost everywhere. It's 47% uh, ABV. And so cheers. Uh, if uh, We sent out the list of it uh, to anyone who was asking. So hopefully if you're out there, you're drinking along with us. Mm. That is great. Good stuff. That's yeah. Spicy. So I, DJ, you are not the big bourbon brink, drinker mm-hmm. and neither is Braden. So I'm curious what you guys think of this. Like I said, spicy. I don't know why. I <laughs> yes. just said, that's what it hit me. I was like, it's spicy. It's good. It's good. Yeah. I get that spicy. Very it cool. also has a kind of a sweetness to it. It's tasty. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, that's a good bourbon. Will will be like that. You can get this online for fifty dollars, and I found this one. I think over at Costco for like forty five dollars here in Orange County. So it's accessible, and people can find it uh, if they look. Not a lot of looking needed, like in the old days. All right, so enjoy that, guys. And now let's. I, first thing I want to ask you guys at SVS about are your new speakers, the um, the evolution. Those things, when you guys announced them, they looked pretty incredible. Oh. Thank you. 
Well, we are beyond excited. I know these are uh, the culmination of, uh, I would say, Smith's life work, life's work. I mean, this is something that's been in the works for quite a while. This is sort of our no holds barred approach to uh, to speaker design. Um, you know, I, I think we'll get into some of the very finer details when we do a, a live broadcast on our SBS audio file happy hour in a couple of weeks. But what I can tell you is that they will officially drop this Tuesday, March 26th. So if you want to get all the details from our site, I will have some other content available to be able to, to read up on those. We can do that. But, um, you know, I'm, I'm as interested as you gentlemen are to hear uh, some of Smith's philosophy on speaker design and sort of what brought him to this point. And, uh, you know, just those processes that, that get you to, uh, to a truly flagship reference speaker. Yeah. You know, honestly, I, I, I still am kind of like pinching myself that we put everything that we did into the ultra evolution, especially like the, especially the towers, like there's, you know, time alignment and the force canceling and just, you know, the, a lot of those things to find them in, um, just to find them all together in a product isn't totally common and to find all those things in a product that is more accessible than when you would normally see it in like this, you know, stratosphere kind of expensive products. Um, it's pretty, it's pretty exciting for me because you know, I've been, I've been just eating speakers since I was a kid and, uh, and every, in every, like I just consume it in every way that I can. And to work with the team and, and put something like these, like these together, has been just totally magical. I, I just still can't believe we're, we're actually doing it. So Smith, let me let me ask you this. How two, a couple of questions. How long ago did you guys even start this process? And did you achieve everything that you wanted? Like it, like when you start out, I, I have an idea as an artist, as a creative thinker. It's like you start out with an idea in your head. Did you get everything that you wanted? I mean, some, in a lot of ways, like the design process, which is very iterative. Um, and we have just some really creative minds on our team. Um, you kind of end up getting more than you expected. Right. So you go, you kind of go into it and, and a lot of things are just on paper and like, Oh, we're going to do this, yeah. and this, and this, and then we're going to make these things work this way and all that kind of stuff. And then you start building it up and you run into challenges and then you overcome those challenges and then you find new challenges. And then a, as you get, to the final product, you suddenly find like, oh man, we're we're actually achieving things that I didn't what weren't we weren't even weren't even expecting. We weren't even looking for these kinds of things. And so um yeah, it's you kind of go into it with a mindset and then you have to have some flexibilities for the realities of physics and 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 design. But then you find these other rewards that are just totally magical. And so yeah, every 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 speaker project we've, I've ever worked on has always kind of had the end culmination of where you're just like, oh, like this is it, and and then you and you get all the rewards kind of coming together. Um, but these these speakers, I mean, depending on how you how you start counting, like maybe maybe you say we've been, we've always been working towards this, right? We've always we've always been tr trying to get to this. Yeah. Um, but that sounds like a more Nick succinctly. Answer. Yeah, right. <laughs> Seems like a, like a very political answer. I've always been trying to get to this. Yeah. Um, but no, the reality is that uh, we started kicking around designs on these years ago. And we didn't we didn't really start finding our footing and our direction until maybe probably almost three years ago. That And so, you know, I'm sure Gary and the team would have very much liked us to launch these products much earlier than this. <laughs> um, but uh, like all management. Sometimes these, yeah, yeah. It's like, why isn't it done yet? Um, so, because it needs it needs the time that it deserves. So well, you gotta wait for the paint yeah. to dry on the gloss. <laughs> was was there like an initial impetus? Did you sit down and say, we want to build a new flagship, we want to build the best thing we've ever built? Or was there a specific problem you were trying to solve? What was the kind of origin story? Uh it, it's a little bit of all of that. I mean, it's, it's taking, it's taking, you know, as, as you develop products and design products, you kind of, you're building a toolbox, right? You're building a toolbox of skills and knowledge and experiences. And then you can start integrating new literal tools um, that maybe you, you've never had an opportunity to use before. And so um, uh, at some, we, 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 you know, we were kind of in between projects and we were just like, you know, we, we need to get started on this ultra series refresh. And we didn't want it to be like up at the beginning. We're like, it shouldn't just be a refresh. 
Like we don't, there are no sacred cows. Like if we're gonna, if we're gonna do something new, let's make it new. And so that's when we started throwing all the ideas in there and trying to figure out like, you know, can we do force cancellation? Can we do time alignment? Can we do uh, a center, a central array? And um, and then new, you know, my coworker, uh, Jack Mules in, in New Zealand, who's a gifted audio engineer, he, he, he started finding these other tools that allowed us to do new, basically new material sciences, um, like uh, chemical etching and vapor deposition and all, all these things that we were able to, that really weren't even possible, you know, 10 years ago. Oh, wow. Steve, right, what so, do we got going on? Yeah, you know. <laughs> Um, we've got some um, some questions coming in, guys. So I don't know whether uh, Nick and, and Smith, you're uh, you're okay to answer some of these. Um, someone, another Nick, says, um, "I wondered why SVS is only made in wall subs and no other in walls." Well, I, I will attempt that one, and Smith, you can uh, steer me <laughs> sure. if I go in the wrong direction. I think when you when you do an in wall subwoofer. Um, you know, there, there's competition out there, but, you know, with our pedigree with subwoofers, we were really able to bring a lot of what we have already learned about uh, creating great, you know, low frequency products to the in-wall category. When you're talking about in-wall and in-ceiling speakers, I mean, you kind of have to start with like five or 10 different SKUs. They have to fit different, you know, size, um, you know, uh, enclosure or, uh, you know, you have to have a lot of different solutions. You can't just have one. So I think when we decided to tackle the subwoofer in wall with our 3000 in wall, you know, we wanted to bring something that had a lot of the, the heritage that we built with the, the um, control app, uh, the sealed cabinet design, which is like super tight and it allows us to have sort of this enclosure. With speakers, there's just such a crowded place out there. You have your snap AVs, you have, you know, these uh, other uh, big box manufacturers with I think a lot of the, uh, you know, installers, the people who are actually, you know, putting these in. They, uh, they defer to those because they're cheap, they're easy, um, you know, and, and so for a high performance brand to go down that road, uh, I think it, it would sort of taken resources away from, from projects that are a little bit more uh, in line with what's, what's truly SVS. And, and that's sort of my marketing answer, I guess you could say, um, you know, because again, a lot of people, that, that's probably the most we're requested product category is like, I want that SVS performance in an in wall, but there's limitations to getting that level of performance so you're almost compromising on some level to even enter the category um and you can make you know a good enough in wall uh but for us to be a performance brand and have something like that um you know i, I just don't think it aligns with what we're trying to accomplish at this point in uh you know our history hmm. do they do, within wall subs, it never will yeah <laughs> <laughs> Do they, do they do they have to be made in a way that doesn't just destroy the the plaster? You know the the the, uh, the drywall <laughs> and things like that. Yeah, yeah. Do they do they have to be fabricated in such a way that they're not just going to blow out the wall in about two seconds it, as soon as you put it, you, in part one on? <laughs> you do you do have to think about that absolutely and mm -hmm. like um, yeah. There's there's a there's a lot and actually so on in our in wall subwoofers. There's actually a couple of ways that you can mount it, right? There's a kind of traditional like dog leg where it's a it's a, a little you know dog leg that basically Tab. flips out from the, the yeah. yeah the kind of flag that kind of flips out from the cabinet and then squeezes the the sheetrock or the drywall, and that's you know the the ninety nine percent very common way, and that and for most people that's that's enough, but then to consider like also the impact of the, the product and the size and then to make it flexible, we have actually through holes in the, in the front baffle. And so if you wanted to screw it directly into a stud, um, that's another way to do it. But, but all these things, and there's, there's gaskets and we spend, you wouldn't believe how much time we spend choosing and tuning gaskets just for, for everything, for every part of the product to just make sure that it's going to be, bulletproof and have longevity and reliable and then also deliver all the acoustic performance and then also you know shake you and your experience not not your house down so you know it is a, it is a challenge yeah, category think the in-wall subwoofer category too you know you had um before we came along there was a, you know there's some solutions out there that are either very difficult to install or they don't get you you know that level of performance you expect from a legit subwoofer uh, so we saw a real opportunity there to to put the svs name on something that would deliver you know 
a true SVS experience. Um, and it's it really caught fire. You know, I think it's it sort of taught us about what sort of opportunities there are. Um, and, uh, you know, it, it's definitely uh, given us a lot of road inroads with integrators who, you know, again, we're just thinking of us as sort of the, that big box subwoofer brand. Um, but now we're, we're definitely more of a player in the integration space. Yes. It's a, it gives it more to, to work with then, doesn't it, I suppose, because those that have smaller rooms, and I am one of those people, I've got a, a single skin carriage that I had converted into a theatre, um, and so space is an absolute premium, you know, every inch counts, um, yeah. and so having that option is a, is a good thing to, to, to do. Um, yeah, but uh, yeah, and and again, it's aesthetics as well, isn't it? It's it's the uh, I think we've, we've talked before about the sort of uh, the the aesthetics committee, um, the uh, <laughs> the other half, and uh, not wanting these <laughs> giant boxes on display. So having that option is a really good thing, isn't it? And gives that that flexibility, as you say. Yeah, there's there's a reason why the whole in wall and ceiling category exists, and I mean floor space is, can be very precious. So it's it's a very fair argument. Yeah. Hey Ari, you want to uh, hit the uh, next bourbon here? I'm trying to tell Oh, I got to slog off my uh, toast. I really like this uh, toasted barrel. Oh, sure, I can, of course. I get a yeah. little bit, almost like a roasted marshmallow I don't kind say, of sweetness to it. I don't say no. So, <laughs> next up is Old Forester. There we go. Eighteen ninety-seven bottled in Bond whiskey. So this is bottled and bond and what bottled and bond means is back in the old old days people were cheating and calling stuff bourbon that really wasn't or they were mixing in other um alcohol so the government came up with the bottled and bond act and that was to guarantee that what you were drinking was indeed bourbon and so it is uh, to be bottled and bond it needs to be under the your warehouse that you store the bourbon in and you age it in needs to be federally controlled and bonded it needs to be a minimum of four years old and the product of one distillation season and uh, one distiller and one distillery bottled at 100 proof or 50 percent abv so this old forester i really like this thing it, it let's see what do i have it here I bought it at Costco for like $45. In California, you can buy uh, spirits at Costco. Some other states you can't. And uh, I think you can find it for $50 in other spots. So uh, it's a little bit higher in proof. Not much, but just a little bit more. <laughs> but you still get that sweet flavor. It, mm. It's kind of like everything that you had on the other one just amped up a little bit. You get like a hint of like honey. Like, like, yeah, for sure, right yeah, for sure, yeah. and it's yeah. got a, it's got a, it's got a great finish on it too, and yeah. um, <clears throat> it's this is dangerous because you can sit here and sip it before long you've like sipped half the bottle. Yeah, it's very smooth. <laughs> Every sip goes, goes down easier. Yeah. Uh, so just, can I just ask another question? Yeah. <laughs> yes. Am, am, I, am I allowed to? Because I, I I have this memory of uh, I guess it was probably like two years ago, Smith. You had sent a uh, a bunch of like line drawings of different cabinets, you know, for uh, for what our new speakers could be. And uh, you know, I remember looking looking at them, and I had a, a strong reaction to you know actually what ended up being pretty much close to the the uh, end model for our towers. And I'm just curious where you begin that journey. Is it with the cabinet design? Is it with the driver configuration? Is it with something else like the material science you were me mentioning? Like, what is that very first step where you're like, this is this is the platform that we're gonna we're gonna begin things with? Like a a lot of the a lot of the speaker design kind of a, like acoustic design principles are not new. Like time alignment is not a new principle. It's been around for decades. Force cancellation, not a new principle. It's been around for decades. Um, and, you know, like kind of central, like Diapolito arrays and things like that, not new, been around for a long time. And we, we were kind of spitballing a lot of what's good and challenging and uh, about these different principles and like how they, how they work best and like where they kind of fall down and like, you know, how you try to mitigate that and in all these kinds of things. And we were really thinking about like, how how hard it is for you know normal people to actually have access to the products that have these principles uh, applied and then we started kind of having 
this, these, these dreams of like, oh, could we do, could we do all of them? Like, could we do a lot of these? And so that's, that became kind of a, a series of, of inspirations for, for where it went. Like some of, some of the principles, some of the early designs didn't include all these things. And so then there's also the challenge of like, is it manufacturable? Could we, can we actually build this reliably? Like, can we make it affordable? Can we make it, you know, is this kind of thing going to be like a, like a million dollars a speaker? Like we, the world doesn't need that. It certainly doesn't need it from us. And so um, that in the beginning, there was a lot of just this kind of give and take of, of these kind of very cool, very capable design principles and how they can kind of be married together in a new way. That's, you know, that's kind of like the, like the, the initial egg that, that bore the whole, the, all the towers and the whole product line. A lot of the material science stuff kind of came over the process as we started looking at, cause we knew we like, like on the tweeter, we knew we had a great tweeter, but we also knew that we should be able to do better. Right. And so we started looking at all these different materials and, and different ways of treating the, 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 the dome and, and how to build the diffuser, uh, the, the phase ring and, and the grill over the tweeter. And that's, and that's where some of these new fruits that we weren't really predicting, we weren't expecting came into it. Um, we learned that dip, uh, vapor deposition started to become more accessible, still very new, very much on the forefront of, of material science. And, and um, but suddenly making that accessible, it's just like, oh, not only is it accessible, but like it's, it's viable and it has real benefits. So, you know, we had to do a lot of development just for that. Um, sorry. Yeah. I'm kind of rambling, but no, that's, I love this. Um, <laughs> let me ask you this though. And it, it, Try to it, give actually, some idea. it hits a question <laughs> that somebody in the chat, Garinder in the chat asked, he's like, how will these new ones work along with the older lines of SVS speakers? Yeah. And I was thinking about like how you go about like voice matching your line mm -hmm. and voice matching these and then how like because of course there's going to be an improvement here. But at the same time, you want to have something that's going to be, you know, upgradable, right? Like maybe yeah, you just do absolutely. your front stage, but you keep your backstage and then you move pieces. And that's what you guys have always done so well. Right. It's like. You take your elevation speakers you can use them for anything but then when you're ready to use them just as elevations you can get the nice mm -hmm. front yep. how what's the process of like voice matching all of this how do you tune all these things i mean the so all basically like here's here's our recipe by the way so <laughs> yeah yeah um <laughs> all the, right uh, write this down you, okay, you're getting <laughs> okay here we go um no so it's, That's why it's we plied you with of... bourbon. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Let me tell you something about that. Yeah. Um, yeah, but it's not um, it's not going to work well if by the end of this podcast, uh, underneath Smith's name, it says X Chief Designer. Early retirement, Gary. Like Smith, <laughs> stop it. Um, no, we 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 actually very openly talk about this. That uh, a lot of the design process, it's very. Uh, you know, scientific and objective. And the scientific objective part is simulations and modeling that's all done on computers. And then you're building mock-up parts and you're just, you know, matching that and then, you know, fixing problems and developing, developing, developing. And that, and that gets you to, wow, like 90%. And uh, if you launch that 90%, it'll be a horrible product. Um, it might even be like 95%. And the magic is the magic of voicing is largely that last little bit and it takes just as long. And so the voicing process, that's where like the last bit of the product design becomes super iterative where, and what I mean by that is you're, you're, you have all these critical objective measurements of the product in the chamber, ground plane, near field, far field, on axis, off axis, just like all the, the individual drivers, the system, uh, simulated crossovers, like the whole thing. You have all of that homework basically up front. And then you finally get to a point where like, I think we're ready to listen to it. And so you listen to the product and you were, we're never listening to a product in a vacuum. It's against critical reference products it's the old products it's other products it's it's everything and um then you make some adjustments and do some little tweaky like oh this component should be here and do these things and then you make some changes and now you got to go back into the anechoic chamber and you do all the measurement work again 
And that, those couple of steps, you do those countless times, truly. Like that, if there's blood, sweat, and tears in speaker design, that's where it is. And um, I've definitely called my my wife from the from like the research facility, like crying, like I got, I'm not done yet. I need more time. Um, but uh, I hate this one. It, I don't want to hear it again. Yeah, yeah. but it's but it, but that's that's the kind but of when you're talking about the, the timbre, the actual timbre of the speakers. Like, mm -hmm. what's the definition of that, and why are you able to listen to the Ultra series, the Ultra Evolution with the Prime? Like, what is it about? Yeah timbre that helps you put those together versus putting it with say a magna planar speaker or you know electrostatic or you know some other kind of beryllium tweeter like what are those things that actually allow you to timbre match and what does that mean yeah so i mean timbre matching within svs is really because we we try and make a, a speaker that's uh, invisible we're just we're just trying to impart the recording we're just trying to be a, a, a conduit right and so which is also you know that, that that's hard it's hard to it's hard to do that well and so we always kind of know from a, from a series of reference tracks like this is what this should sound like this is what this sh like how this double pluck upright bass should be enunciated and we know you know the the sound of you know uh um you know the percussion the, the brush the brushes on the on the snare like you know there's all these little things like nora's voice nora's vote nora's voice i should have another drink nora's voice <laughs> and like how it can sometimes zing and spit and all these things and like how we can make sure that we're retaining the character of the of the performer and the instrument and the and the scenery um that's something we've always been focused on. We've never not been focused on that. And so combining that with kind of the technical aspect of like, well, we should put the crossover point around here. And then we have to really make sure we are balancing the response of the tweeter with the mid range and how they, they blend together and how they measure. Like that's all, that's all married together. And so you can, so, you, you know, can try and do it all just, yeah. Oh, sorry. I was going to say, you bring up the point of Nora's voice. I spoke with Gary many, many years ago, uh, Gary Yakubian. He's the CEO of SVS for those watching. And he mentioned Taylor Swift. And mm -hmm. I just kind of laughed it off because it's like, oh, that's what my daughters listen to. But he said her music is engineered so clearly that it's a very good reference source. And we all have references that we listen mm -hmm. to. I, there, I have like five tracks that I always go to anytime I'm listening to new speakers. And I included her in a couple of them because of exactly what Gary said. It, if you find music that is engineered really well, you're going to hear things in your speakers that uh, will a, a flawed speaker won't play it right or you won't right. even hear it. So uh, that's yeah. it's good to have those references. And my guess is all with all that analytical stuff you do you probably just go in there and listen to music as well and just kind of say eh, i i can't pinpoint it but it didn't sound right to me yeah i mean it's actually it's a really it's kind of a magical quality of gary like normally you wouldn't expect a ceo of a company to just come in and be like well i'm gonna listen to the speakers too and tell you what i think and he does and actually it's an it's an important barometer for us um and because actually he he has he has excellent excellent like ear brain memory excellent hearing and uh and imparts his feedback in a way that as engineers we're kind of like oh i i know what he's talking about and i yeah. and then we can even think about like in a, a like in a measurement like oh i i know where that is mm. and so we can start adjusting things and 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 kind of collaboratively um so to you know voice voice the product um but yeah test tracks are are a critical must and to anybody that's that's listening to this, if you are ever looking to A, B, or like listening, evaluate speakers, choose your own reference tracks, things that you intimately know, but be careful because you will murder and ruin those tracks. They will become, yeah. <laughs> they will become unlistenable. So Smith, let me ask you this because like I do that. I recommend the same thing, the same tracks you've been listening to your whole life. So you mm -hmm. learn from it. You'll know what you're supposed to be hearing. Um, yeah. When I upgraded from my, I had NHTs for like 25 years and I upgraded cool. to the ultras across the front and then now SVS all around. 
you start awesome. hearing new things and you're mm -hmm. like, oh my God, that wasn't there before. And it's, uh, we don't have to get into all of that, but what tracks do you listen to? And do you have anything proprietary that you guys have recorded so that you no. know what it was like to start? No, but that, but that is actually, there is some validity to that approach. Um, we don't have like a recording studio. We don't have, yeah. uh, I mean, there, there are, you know, we sometimes are even using just noise, right? You know, you're just using sine waves and you're using pink noise. And like, you know, that's, that's an aspect to it too. Um, the, the music stuff, when I, when I joined SVS and started working with Gary, he had the tracks that he, that were like his babies, that were his points of, of reference. Um, and so I kind of really had to, to learn those. Um, and so now I intimately know those, those same tracks. And so Gary and I can talk about something that's kind of, uh, you know, ephemeral kind of, kind of, kind of nebulous, like music, like Bob Dylan's voice and, and then translate that into product design. Um, cause so give cause us your best impression like, of Bob Dylan's voice. What does Bob Dylan sound like? Let me go fire like? up my, uh, my lawnmower real fast. You don't do it. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> or I mean, um, let's let's not but let's be inclusive. Or Taylor Swift. Either way, it's it's, it's fine. We, we don't mind. Yeah. And actually, the Taylor Swift thing is really interesting because she basically is re-releasing all of her older music, and they're actually fixing stuff in those old recordings. And they've actually they've actually like isolated like problems and the like the old old recordings and like oh now now we have an opportunity to like to kind of fix those things and maybe you know do some adjustments so um so yeah i, I did a fun thing uh sorry go ahead Braden. i was just gonna say along the lines of murdering those tracks you can never listen to them again ara and i when we were at sony pictures there was a uh, married with children clip that everybody would play over and over and over again <laughs> to where i just couldn't hear it anymore and then when i yeah. moved on i was at a dot com working on digital audio i had a copy of um one week by bare naked ladies that i just listened to over and over and over again and i can't hear that song anymore i'm fine giving yeah, that one up but do you have one that you've murdered that you're like just turn it off i can't hear it anymore uh i have basically two sets of of test tracks i have like like the official like gary gary svs test tracks and those if any of those come on casually like if i just hit like shuffle or something and it just comes on straight up i'll have a panic attack um <laughs> like that's that's happened while driving and i was like no 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 just like i just like smash the stereo to turn it off i'm like oh okay um i do have another set of my tracks and it's long on kind of on purpose and i yeah. basically don't really tap into it until like i'm at 99 percent so that i know that i'm basically at a place of enjoyment but it's it's the whole spectrum it's uh you know, there's nine inch nails, there's Beck, there actually there's no Beck anymore. Now the Beck is like working. It's like, I can't listen to Beck anymore. Um, Jamie Cullum, who's a great uh, jazz, jazz singer and pianist. Um, there's some classical stuff. There's like, you know, some electronic music. It's, it's kind of the whole spectrum. Um, and that, and that's what honestly home theater. how I, yeah. Well, hey, I mean, Nick, before yeah. you get to that, here's what here's a, a great question to go along with that. Van Gool in the chat saying, what is better to listen to when testing out speakers two channel or at most tracks? I have my opinions, but Smith, you're the engineer expert. What do, what do you say? I mean, due to the nature of my work, a lot of it is is mono even. And a lot of it eventually turns into two channel and if you can do mono right and you can do two channel right you know multi-channel should should easily follow um that, that's my that's my belief um but we do we do get into listening to surround so surround sound and, and and all that atmos is atmos versus just other surround sound formats is unique in that because it's basically object oriented and it's got better dynamic range and it's got better bandwidth to it um it kind of rewards just it just rewards more right um but from the nature of my work is mostly most it's mostly two channel because if you have to be able to do that right first right yeah and it's i mean what i've always said is well my answer to that would have been whatever you're used to right goes mm -hmm. back to the original like if you know these scenes whether it's home theater or oh, yeah. you know, tracks yeah. you you go with that but 
even your basic, like you were saying, your Atmos, all of these, it's basically two channels trying, but they're moving around you. Which two channels are pulling? And now with Atmos, it's probably all of them, but you got to get that two, that basic right. And that's, I yep. mean, so you start there and then work your way up. Speaking right. of home theater, like Nick said, what are there any tracks like you? I mean, we've had Larry on and he's the expert. <laughs> and I love his scenes, but what I do, do you, do you I don't I don't use Ninja Turtles if that's what you're no? wondering. Oh. <laughs> no. <laughs> I don't use Ninja Turtles. I don't use Flicker Stick. I don't, you know. Um No, I mean not like a our our main two channel tracks are it's it's Miles Davis, it's Bob Dylan, it's Nora Jones, it's Nine Inch Nails, it's a uh, Casey Musgraves, Billy Eilish has been introduced recently. Um there's a there's a there's a few others, but um, it's try it's, listening it's, to a... Hey Nineteen by um, Steely Dan. It's probably the best engineered <laughs> track out there. Yeah, no, I mean, and it's um like it's it's kind of anecdotal because like my playlist, my like my work playlist, that's a collaborative element. Like it has to it has to work for Gary, it has to work for me, it has to work for for, for Jack and, and Ruben. Like like when we talk about music, we have to know it. And so when we yeah. talk about it, we know what we're like, it, it, it's just a, it's like an, another analogy. It's like another language that we have to then translate back and forth. But for, for everybody else that's out there, totally find tracks that you know intimately well, be okay with maybe murdering them and making them unlistenable. <laughs> um, but it, it should be stuff that you know how it feels, you know, like what it delivers, you know what it, it should sound like. And if it, and if you listen to it and it surprises you in a good way, then that's, that's a good thing. Right. And so that just kind of elevates it. That's, that shows you. And you're choosing things for different directional. Tonal, you're choosing things for like yeah, different totally. tonal qualities too. Like there's a track yeah. that maybe will be more bass forward and yeah. other yep. ones that, like you said, yeah. Dylan, you're just trying to see if his voice sounds as gravelly as it should. Um, so, you <laughs> yeah. know, I think the yeah. same thing applies to home theater. There are, yep. you know, certain moments where it's really going to allow the center channel to shine, and it's going to be that mm -hmm. sort of, you know, female vocalist on stage, like a, you know, a, what's our Greatest Showman track that's been played death mm -hmm. at this point. Um, but then you'll have other multi-channel demos that really excite either the height effects or the side surrounds, and and you can get a sense for how well the speakers are blended together in terms of yeah. creating that so cohesive sound stage um you know so i think there's there's all different co kinds of content uh but you know mm -hmm. dismiss point if you can nail that two channel aspect where it's even mono where it's just pure you know assessment of whatever it is the treble the bass the mid-range um and if it gets that right and really reveals things that you haven't heard before um you know i think that's a, that's a good litmus test for uh for how it can do anything well yeah yeah. Ari, right, you ready for the uh, the next bourbon? And then I have oh boy. two questions. I got a question that came in to the HT guys and a great question in the chat going too. Okay, we so we're, we're going with Heaven Hill. This is also bottled in bond, so it's going to have the same ABV, 50%. But this one's aged seven years, so the four year is just a minimum. You can go beyond that. So this is my favorite bottle, uh, bottled in bond. And uh, you know what's funny about it is it was just kind of no one thought much of it. They changed the label a few years ago and everyone went crazy for it. It was just a generic <laughs> label, but but it's amazing <laughs> how a label will draw people to the bourbon. And, and that's what happened here. But it's a good bourbon. So. Mm. Yeah. Smith, have you ever seen a beautiful looking speaker that sounds like garbage? I feel like that. I mean, I won't name names, here. but I've, I've yeah, I've I've collected demos in my mind of ones that have hit both both ends of the spectrum of just like oh wow like crushing it and then other demos where i'm just like i'm so disappointed like just heartbroken just like oh it's terrible does that so, also yeah, apply I've, to cost are there like super expensive speakers you've heard and like oh man why would someone pay that much money for that versus wow that I've, was a really cheap speaker and it sounds great i i won't say who it was but I saw I saw a room at CES, and they had a uh, pair of speakers that I had never heard before, but I would I'd always seen, and they had a stack of electronics that I knew was bang on, and I and I and they were playing something coincidentally that I knew intimately. They were playing um, 
uh, it was one of the tracks from the symphonic Pink Floyd from the like the London Philharmonic did an album that was that was all Pink Floyd covers by it like a like a full orchestra and so that was playing I was like I gotta go in there and I gotta listen to that and I walked in and I was just I want I mean I don't know what the word was but it was it was like a I was like mortified I was like depressed I was like oh my god it's so lifeless it's so lifeless and I know I know how much this delivers and should deliver and I'm like and part of me is just like maybe it's the room maybe the room is just crushing it and uh yeah but yeah that was like a that was like a hugely disappointing moment and then i went to, i think i went like upstairs went to another room and i heard tool playing on a tiny reasonably high-end rig and i was like just couldn't turn around fast enough to get in the seat and just like push people out of the way like i need to listen to this right now excuse me i need to be here listening to this this is bang on so yeah it's a uh, you you can you can you can have it all. You can it's it's a an amazing spectrum. Nice. Uh, Ari, right, do you want to read the question? Or you want me to? Yeah, I can go ahead. Listener? Okay. Uh listener wrote in to HT guys said for just for this. He says, I have all Niles in wall speakers in my theater living room. I also have an SVS SB two thousand. I'm wondering how SVS in wall subwoofer would compare to the SB two thousand. Like an original SB two thousand. Hmm. Yeah, not the pro. I would apparently. I mean, is that is that to you guys or is it to me? It's to you. It's that's to you. That's to you guys. <laughs> like, SB2. how do you think I, that would compare in into his room? I, the SB two thousand is a fantastic subwoofer. Um, that was a gr that's a great sub. Um, the inwall the inwall brings a lot to the performance that the SB2000 doesn't. Um, so, I mean, beyond just like the app and all of all of the things that come with, with app control and that kind of stuff, the, I would I would probably put take the in-wall over the SB2000. But, it, you know, I think, yeah, I would do can, that. Can the wall can help get more base out of it? Yeah, it kind of like it's not necessarily an apples to apples comparison because it kind of depends on where the SB2000 has to live in the room, right? When you have a product that lives in the room, you know, maybe maybe you're you're stuck with like, well, it has to be there. And maybe that's not necessarily the best place for it. If you're going to be able to put something in the wall, in principle, maybe you have a little bit more freedom for where it can go, you know, but it has to you know usually fit between studs and that kind of thing. But you can basically ensure that you are going to get better boundary loading with the with the the, 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 the with the walls of the room and yeah i didn't even think of it that way but you're right yeah you put a box in the room you're kind of limited yeah. you can't just throw it anywhere there's things in the way yeah. but at the same time i always looked at in walls as like limited like if there's a window there you can't put it but you have to but at the same time you it kind of does open up entire walls yeah. to you because it can just it just goes out of the way so it's interesting. i think it in some ways it, it it could be a little close but i would i would put the 3000 in wall ahead um hmm. you, you just you just have higher power you have two drivers two motors um and you basically ensure the the boundary loading and um it's a it's a it's a far more sophisticated amplifier um, you know, that's, that's almost 10 years of, of SVS subwoofer amplifier development between cool. the SP 2000 and the 3000 in wall. Yeah. So right. I would, I would say that the in wall would definitely deliver. Okay. Uh, this question here, getting back to designing the speaker, I thought this was great. Um, kind of think I know the answer, but the, uh, John in the chat, John Burton in the chat says, as you build up a speaker design, do you plan if as the the buyer has room treatments or not, or does that not matter? Uh, I would say room treatment definitely matters, but from our side, we can't, we cannot assume that, uh, that the person's going to have the speaker is going to have room treatment. Right. So we have to, we had, I mean, it's a complicated thing because we think about this too, especially as we make really big speakers, like, Oh, it's just really big speaker goes into a really tiny room, that kind of thing. Um, so we, we do, we do think about that, but, um, I would say, I mean, room treatment is always a good idea. And actually a lot of room treatment doesn't have to be expensive. Um, things like, you know, I, I would consider room treatment, including like moving your couch, maybe like a foot, a 
away from the back wall, right? Or adding a carpet um, or putting in a bookshelf and just putting stuff on the bookshelf. Like there's actually treat doing room treatment can actually be very reasonable. Um, but but no, yeah, like if you're designing, a, designing speaker, a speaker and you have yeah. to have room treatments in order for it to sound good, yeah. then that you're already nice. starting with a compromised solution. You know, you, totally you got to make a speaker that's going to assume the person's not going to have those. Yeah. And right. then it's just going to take it to that next level um, by yeah. adding those, those uh, bass traps and, and acoustic panels, things like that. Um, I, totally I definitely agree. Uh, yeah. agree. And, and I'm on that process right now. You know, I want to see the AB between my, my home theater uh, pre and post, um, room treatments, but uh, I got to get my, my ultra evolutions in there first. <laughs> but yeah, right. To get to the point. <laughs> Don't we all? You know, we, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But, but right. To answer the question, like for sure, like, you know, we're, we're designing a speaker that should be able to work in any room, right. Whether that has treatment or not. Yeah. But sometimes you'll get those people who go to like in the old days, you'd go to a stereo shop and you'd have a listening room and you'd listen to the speakers. And they sounded fantastic because the room was treated and it put mm -hmm. it in an optimal uh, place right. to listen to. Then they, they'd get the speakers home and it didn't sound anything like that. So uh, nowadays, almost all online speaker sales offer some sort of in-home audition. You're, you guys have a, a quite a long one, which is really good. So it really gives you a chance to listen to them over time to either figure out that it's not working in your room or make the treatment so that it does yeah. sound optimal. Or, you know, also gives you the time to reach out to our team, you know, Ed Mullen and right. the customer service team, like we call them sound experts because that is what they are. And so they're, they're helping customers all the time with just whatever is necessary to make sure that they're getting a, a kind of a, a fair evaluation, kind of the best evaluation. All right. I know, uh, Nick, you've got to go. Uh, we're actually over your allotted time, but uh, no, let's get no, this I'm good. Little... I have till seven I ten here, so I, I oh, bought myself oh, a little oh, extra. Well, here we go. Yeah. But let's get this last bourbon. <laughs> Nick's is finding then... time. Oh no, I, I got time. Yeah. So All right. <clears throat> this last one is a hard to find bourbon. Um, you can find it online certain places. It goes for about $120, $130, and it's a four-grain bourbon, Ooh. which means it will be a little bit um, sweeter and rounder, if you will. I don't like using the term smooth, but it, it, it'll just be a, a little bit more balanced, uh, but a little bit on the sweet side. And uh, uh, this one, you're going to taste a little bit like a, an apple pie. Uh, it, it'll just Damn. obviously not directly apple pie, but kind of give you a, a feeling for it. And uh, this one's got like a leathery finish. And I'm hoping that this one is your favorite. And I'll, I'll give you my list uh, after we're done. But uh, this this is a really good bourbon. It might be the bourbon talking. That's why I'm just shouting it out and not waiting my turn. But yep, two, two, two of these in a row with the you know, highest, what, alcohol is my favorite. Yeah. And we did this back <laughs> in December. 58%? Huh. Funny how yeah. that happens. Yeah, I don't know. That it's, does and, not and taste it's like the 58%. I've been sipping the other Oh, it's, 50, three. it's 53. It's 53%. It, is. it doesn't taste like one of those high ABVs at all. Um, I'm definitely getting uh, yeah. hints of that apple pie. I thought I smelled on the initial little quaff from my nose, a little port smell to it almost. Um, but then tasting it, you're right. You definitely get a little bit of that sort of apple pie note. Great taste. Yeah, really good. Wow. Yeah, two, like, yeah, so I I picked good bourbons for us tonight, guys. Thank you. I'm, uh, I'm only nailed. feeling mildly jealous with my Budweiser. <laughs> <laughs> Steve, you you and I can do a we can do a, a, a scotch tasting, just Ooh. you and me. That's fine. We can just, sold. Done. We can fix that later. <laughs> oh, I'm good with scotch too. I'm oh, good with okay. scotch. Oh, and I'm I'm thinking, guys, after a you know a couple of hours of that, we, we won't be able to hear anything. <laughs> it'll all sound good steve yeah, it'll yeah. it'll all sound good <laughs> and we won't remember any of it either so it'll be fine <laughs> it's all recorded <laughs> all right all right um so i got a real quick question now that we've got four bourbons in us and everyone's a little bit loose so nick smith i know you have talked about how the ultra evolution is kind of the culmination of everything you wanted to do and it's all in that speaker if that's true what's next 
<laughs> well, can we you know watch these awesome first? Yeah, that. no. Um, yeah, yeah. <laughs> there, there's some big, uh, there's some big things coming for us later this year as well. Um, you know, I think we have to uh, sort of let these settle and, and percolate. I mean, we're we're about and 11, 12 years in the making with yeah. these. Um, <laughs> but you know, I think we're going to enter some categories that might surprise people in the next two years. And I, and I know Smith's team and our team, like we've doubled down on our uh, engineering and our product design. Like, there's a lot of uh, other brands out there who have sort of said, you know what, we're going to kind of keep it close and and uh, not invest as much in, in, in new product development. Um, and that's not the path we're taking. Like that is where we're really, truly throwing a lot of our resources and we want to enter new categories. We want to redefine some of the, the categories that we're in with some new technologies. Um, so I did see somebody ask if we're going to do like a 21 inch subwoofer, not 21 inches, but you may see some, uh, some things that uh, will, uh, take it to another level than we've been to uh, there it is yeah <laughs> i don't know what is what's the obsession with these measurements it's like a tractor pull it's like you know how big can you go and how loud can you get like there's other things than just the uh size of the driver that matter here um so how, how I think dare you you'll see some, how dare you i know how dare you I say know, that i know <laughs> and that's fine like there's there's uh size there's plenty of subs matter? out there that are 20 inches in <laughs> now don't now you're paraphrasing John Deej. Um, here. Yeah. <laughs> here, here, here's I feel like here's I'm talking my, somebody how to say it. Here's here's my non <laughs> response. I am super busy. Mm. I've never been very busier. cool. That's awesome. And my my yeah. team yeah. is has never been busier. So oh, we're, so we're, we got good things busy. coming. Yeah, uh, we have we good things coming. Opportunity. Super busy. Yeah, we see a major opportunity in the space that we operate in and, and what we're trying to do to to bring high performance audio to more people. And, uh, you know, I think it's uh, Smith's team has got their finger on the pulse. Like it, it, we talked about it, like there's material science, there's cabinet design, there's uh, like power, even things you can do with power as far as subwoofers go that are really innovative that haven't been explored before. Um, so, you know, it's not just about making a bigger driver. There, there's so many more things that can be done to uh to set that bar at a different level um and that's where our focus is you know we want to bring things that people will like a, a broader audience will actually embrace not just like those you know tractor pull like you know i just want the biggest loudest you know mm. whatever it is um so that's kind of where our focus is you know we've got our accessories too we're going to have some accessory line coming out so it's not just uh it's not just speakers and subs. We we truly want to transcend that and uh, become a full fledged audio brand. Not become we are, uh, but keep, you know driving innovation <laughs> and taking that uh, you know to different places. You just said something um, in there too, Nick. Um, the cabinet design and let me tell you, like when these when you guys showcase these at CES, the first call I made was I, I was in love with the cabinet design absolutely in love with the cabinet design and ira shaking his head that was my first call ira what does this mean is this legit is this marketing what does this mean and ira's like no that's legit that's timing the way you position the tweeter and then blah 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 and he went through the whole thing and i was like all right that's awesome but i absolutely how did you what went into that cabinet design or was that like like one of your first thoughts or it's i mean i it's beautiful i've I'm, me personally, like I, I've I've always had a little bit of a love for time alignment. Just just you know, I my 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 education was in it was in physics, and so you know a, that that analogy for, like there's a there's a physics analogy for how a speaker works, and there's an like there's an EE analogy, and there's this or electronics analogy, and so time alignment is this to me is like a very is a very like beautiful kind of romantic straightforward no nonsense kind of way of of aligning drivers so that they can do their job the best that they can and so i to me that i think that's a that's a very powerful and very kind of beautiful way of of getting the drivers to kind of coalesce into into a, a unified element and and making that marriage and so um to me like time alignment was was a very cool thing i'm just like if we can do it we should try to do it. And so um, time alignment really drives cabinet shape a lot. And and you'll there's there's lots of people doing time alignment. Time alignment, again, is not new at all. Um, but it's hard to do time alignment in a way that's manufacturable and also like accessible. And so that was kind of the, the challenge to us as a team. It's like, how do we how do we do this in a way that will be beautiful, 
but not polarizing and effective and manufacturable and like we can actually build it not just one right. we're going to build a lot of them and so yeah yeah that that's um, what will give you that experience where when you said the speakers disappear it's mm -hmm. it's i'm going to use the term magical you just sit there and it's oh, yeah. as if the sound is going directly into your brain it's it's hard to explain and it's so funny you talk about the time alignment and I'm sitting here thinking, all right, when I hit my router, I need to be less than a millimeter off in the depth because <laughs> when I build the speakers uh, between the, the, the tweeter and the and the woofer, I'm not talking time alignment, but you want to get those things so that yeah. the sound hits your ears as equally as possible. Now, since I make unicorns, I can just tweak until I get it right. But you guys, <laughs> uh, you, you need to um, you need to build at mass uh, scale. Right it's a lot harder. Exactly right. Of course, you got more expensive equipment than I do, too. So just give me one week in your shop. <laughs> <laughs> no, but I think the end result is really being able to, like, see sound in space. Like, that's yeah. what yeah, you're trying exactly. to accomplish. You know, yeah. when you talk about imaging, which is sort of this ethereal sort of concept of like, oh, you know, it's got great imaging. That's fine to say. But when you sit down, you know, in the sweet spot between two speakers and you can hear a vocalist over here you can hear a drummer over yeah. here you can hear different effects um you know coming from different points in space like that is when it truly is locked in and it's something where when you have that time alignment and you're able to construct the cabinet in such a way where that sound is hitting your ear at the exact same instant it just locks itself in in such a pinpoint way that uh you don't really know until you know um, you know, and I think so many people are conditioned to listening to mono speakers with music um, or not really having that effect with, with a home theater system. You know, the panning is good. The center channels handle, handling a lot of it. Um, but it is kind of it, I mean, magical is the word to, to use because it, it really does sort of take it to a, a different place when you're able to hear these tracks and, and things you've heard a lot of times, um, but with just a different emphasis and, and different way of uh, appreciating it. Yeah, and then I, I just just to layer onto that, I mean, every every speaker company in the world, they they basically have a, a, so many tools at their disposal to try and make a, a, a kind of married, unified acoustic product uh, to make a speaker. And so, time alignment is just one of those tools to to try and do that. And so, there's a there's a lot of way to try and get to that that end product. And as if you can use as many tools as possible, then you can really get there. And so the Ultra Evolutions product line was really, can we can we capture more of those tools to make this kind of really unified, married um, point source to make this this fantastic delivery system? And um, and so we just we were able to employ more of those things than we ever were before, um, and and make them accessible. I would say. Hey, are you guys able to talk about your new tweeter with the diamond or is that something you want to say for your own live stream? It's up to Nick. I mean, we, we can talk about it at a, a higher level. Uh, we are going to be, I saw oh. a question. We're going to be launching them officially March 26th. So you can check our site. We'll have some information. Uh, Smith and I and Gary actually did a video where we dive into some of the technology, but we'll also do a happy hour on uh, I believe it's April 4th, where we'll really dive in and answer questions specifically. Sorry, I'm putting my marketing okay. hat on now, guys. You'll have to forgive me. No here. problem. No, um, no, no problem. <laughs> but, uh, but just for just so, for the viewers out there, it's a really cool design that uh, it's worth watching yeah. their live stream to get it. No, no. And, and I'm not saying no. I'm just basically setting the table to, to have this conversation <laughs> now. Um, because, uh, again, I, I want to make sure we, we get uh, people to, to pay attention when, when we actually have our resources out there as well but i mean this is the i i actually have a fixation on the material science aspect of this and this was a conversation i'm the marketing guy i'm like oh we got to play up this material science aspect of these speakers this diamond coated tweeter and it makes a huge difference but i don't think people fully appreciate what goes into it and so when you say it i think it becomes sort of like oh people think you're just spouting stuff because yeah. you know it's marketing it's like how much is you know, a diamond coated tweeter or a different sort of uh, um, material used in a driver, glass fiber composite versus poly going to really affect it. And uh, frankly, Smith knows way more about this than I do. But from a marketing perspective, I find it so fascinating that you have these modern technologies that allow you to basically grow diamonds on an aluminum dome tweeter and have it really create acoustic benefits. And so I think from that perspective, Smith, maybe you can speak on a high level to like, 
how you even came across this and like you know are you going to trade shows where it's like oh here's vapor deposition with diamonds we this is how we grow diamond carbon on a on aluminum dome tweeter like that's the part that really fascinates me the story behind where it came from uh i mean so i mean as as a we have a team of engineers small team of engineers and so we we're always kind of paying attention to what's happening in the world, right? And so vapor deposition, we're not the first ones to do it. We're certainly not the first ones to do it. And we're not the first ones to do it in audio. But it hasn't really been accessible until and it's like, it's just now becoming access accessible in a, in a, in a practical way. And so um, we, we had looked at a whole bunch of different materials and we looked at, you know, ceramics, we looked at beryllium, we looked at just like all, all, you know, all the things that are out there for, for tweeter domes, just, just, just the dome itself. And, um, and as we, in, in our research, we found that, okay, there is a way that we can, we can do vapor deposition and, and, and not just do it. We can actually tune it. We can actually adjust you know, the time and, and, and all the constraints that allow you to, to, to kind of make it what you need it to be and make it reliable and make it manufacturable. And so, and that, that's a, that was, a that was something that we, you know, three years ago when we started the project, we didn't know that was even an option. Mm -hmm. Right. And so it was like, as, as, the, as these other technologies kind of evolve, we can, find them and pay attention to them and then kind of realize them in a, in a, in a, yeah. in a way that actually works for us. And so that's, that's kind of what happened with vapor deposition and grow, literally growing uh, dynamite -like carbon on the, on the surface of the dome and then measuring the acoustic benefits of it. I mean, it's, it's, it's it actually from, as an engineering standpoint, it's one of these, it's a very magical moment of just like, Oh my God, I can't believe we can do this. And I can't believe it works. And I can't believe that like we're going to be able to do it and bring it to people. So it's it's pretty cool from from, from my cool. standpoint. It's, it's it's actually very cool. You can tell you're excited about it, which is makes know, me I mean, even more excited about it. No, no, I I half, get it. Half, As an engineer, I glow is when an engineer is excited, it's a good thing. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I love the cubic zirconia comment. That's our prime series. When we refresh the prime series, we yeah. do the uh, cubic zirconia coded uh, diamond. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> diamond budget model quartz, cubic zirconia, like yeah, <laughs> the, the middle light. It's a yellower diamond. <laughs> <laughs> Don't look under it. You know, one of those. Uh, yeah, exactly. Diamonds. Yeah, honey, do you want to get married? Here's a speaker. <laughs> oh i like that does that work <laughs> can it's we like, do that it's like honey for chris for christmas i'm getting you diamonds and then she yeah. goes what does that go right there there's two right, of them there right go. there did you hear it? look i got you too <laughs> let's go uh let's go to the other end. this is my this is another question i wanted to ask like my last one um i think go to the other end of the spectrum the base you guys in at least in my book and a lot of the a lot of my listeners we all were introduced to you guys to svs through subwoofers through sure. you guys changed the landscape of before you guys in my like for me it was like oh you want to get a subwoofer, a good subwoofer a velodyne or whatever it was so expensive you guys come in you break that up and you reinvented the market which i haven't heard your new speakers yet but i think that's what you're doing here but bass, we talked a lot about two channel. You're doing a lot of two channel demoing and stuff. What is it like getting the bass right in these speakers without the subwoofers and how these speakers work? And yes, time alignment and the and the high pitch, you know, the high frequencies. But right. how like how difficult is it to get that bass right for people that I let's be honest, a lot of two channel people don't want to use a subwoofer. That's that's a no no. How mm -hmm. like how difficult is that? Before you answer, uh, Smith, I was, can I just say, I'm at the Montreal Hi-Fi show right now, and I'd say one of the biggest complaints a lot of people have when they go and hear these rooms that are $200,000, $300,000 systems, it's like there's no low end. It's like they sparkle in the high end. They have some nice mid-range, but they just don't deliver on tracks that you've heard 100 times in the bass. And so I do think it's one of the hardest things to get right. Um, and that's just from my experience walking around. So I'll leave it at that. But I, I think that sort of segues you, Smith, to say like, 
it's something we take serious, obviously, based on our pedigree, but there's a lot that goes into it. Yeah, no, there's 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 no there's no conversation we have about a speaker where we're not where we're ignoring some or 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 minimizing some part of it. The base is just as important as the mid range. The mid range is just as important as the as the top end. The the, the spatial qualities, the three D ness of of time, you know, the timeline it brings is just as important as making sure we're getting the port tuning right, we're getting the cabinet volume right, that we're getting the the suspension of all the base drivers just right. So we do, I mean, in truth, we we do basically go ground up on all the drivers. And so um, if we get lucky, sometimes we can we can share a driver. It's like, oh, you know what, this driver is actually going to work really well here. Um, not always the case. And so um, and so that like with the with the Ultra Evolution, we have three towers. Um, all of them effectively share the same tweeter. Two of them share effectively the same mid range. None of them share the same base driver. And oh. so the the attention to what is what does this what does this base driver have to be for this model and the cabinet t- volume and the tuning and the bracing all those things have their own precedent to to make sure that we're doing base the bottom end of the, those bottom registers those bottom octaves as well as we can for for that for that product and, and honestly we're actually you know, I, don't know if, I don't know if Gary would like me to say this but as as a company that's kind of has a pred- uh, pedigree of no, being known as a subwoofer company, we're always trying to challenge ourselves as saying like, well, why should we be a speaker company? People are going to say like, you're just a subwoofer company, just make subwoofers. Why are you getting, making speakers? And it's like, no, we we can make speakers that that kind of transcend that precedent, and so we can make us we can make a speaker that makes great bass. I will always say. Even with huge speakers, you should you should add a subwoofer. But I, you know, that's that's me knowing what subwoofers can always bring to the equation. That being said, like we're gonna always make our tower speakers so that they can perform well, they can perform great, they can make great bass on their own. Because you know, a subwoofer takes space, whether it's in the wall or yeah. it's it's on your floor space. You know, it's, you have to live with these things. Right. Why got? is it so hard for those high-end brands to get it right, though? Like the, that's what I don't understand. Like it seems like you know, I don't know. Maybe maybe that's not the question <laughs> to ask. But like I just noticed because it. Smith, like, I go because Smith is rooms, working like, there. Yeah, yeah. Smith it's like a four hundred thousand right? dollars system. You yeah. can't give me a, a little bit under forty hertz. Like give me something. Like I don't know. I guess they spend no so comment. much on like the Babinga wood cabinet or the. Uh, you know, made of like asteroid rock material or something that, you know, they just can't afford woofers in. But I have that, that's what people say. A lot of people come to these shows and they're like, finally, a room with accurate, controlled low end that I expect mm-hmm. from these tracks that I've heard a hundred times. And, yep. uh, yeah. you know, it's, it's validating. Nice. Uh, let's see. Anybody got anything? What do we got? Cheers. I, I've been talking talk- all the questions. I'm Cheers. trying to stay back. Cheers. Yeah, serious. <laughs> can we uh, can we talk content? Can I plug one uh, thing? And, and this is not your typical hmm. home theater. I did it on our happy hour last uh, last night, but I've just been so into this Earth Sounds. I love nature documentaries on Apple TV. Has anyone heard of Earth Sounds? Has anyone seen it? No, I haven't, heard like, it. I haven't with seen this. it yet. I haven't. I've heard about it though. My listeners, I'm I've too got busy. A few people well, talking about it. Yeah. <laughs> I know if if you're into like nature documentaries, it's basically all about nature and the sounds of nature and, and how that allows them to hunt and how that allows them to find uh, mates. And and it's just the way that they dive into the acoustic part of it and, and talking about how, you know, there's these frequencies that humans can't even hear, but animals are using them and, and even like, uh, you know, plants in nature and, and you know underwater and, and all these different ecosystems around the world it's just fascinating to me so it's just taking that natural world and using immersive sound to really make like uh educate but also just give you an experience that's completely out of the norm like i felt like i was in a rainforest i felt like i was you know a mile underwater and it's just truly fascinating so if you don't like nature documentaries you probably won't like it but the fact that it's solely 
focused on sound and then they spend like the last 10 minutes of each episode talking about the technology that allowed them to record uh some of these frequencies and allow them to be heard by humans and felt by humans for the first time it was really fascinating so that's my plug for uh for content if you're into to nature documentaries and sound uh give it a listen and you'll uh, you'll appreciate it I think i'm gonna check right. that out yeah i mean every yeah. nature documentary has been a letdown since insectia right just saying. <laughs> I remember that guy. Well, this one stepped up uh, a level. So I, I was uh, really happy to experience it. Nice. Well, Nick, we're coming to, we're at 7 11. How are we doing? How are you doing? I'm doing great. I have uh, a couple texts <laughs> that I got to answer. Um, okay. There's some uh, <laughs> Canadian distributors up here in Montreal that I have to meet with tonight. And uh, I've tried to go easy. I have about half left in each one of my bottles here, Aura. This is a, a okay. dangerous way to go about uh, an interview, but uh, I feel looser than I did. <laughs> or, or now, now, you know, now you know our plan. <laughs> or a great way. Man, who, who knows? Yeah. I think well, it's I'm a great way. Smith, I agree with you. It's a great way. <laughs> It is. Yeah, it yeah, absolutely is. Point. And Smith, I'm proud of you. You didn't really uh, reveal any secret sauce, um, but you know we, we definitely want to come. I back think and you revealed more really than I did. A, <laughs> I think I probably did. Yeah, you're definitely uh, no, but it there, it's but great. Yeah. Thanks for you guys joining. You know, SVS, Braden, and I. When we first started, uh, just like what DJ was saying, it was all subwoofers, and as you added more speakers on. It became very obvious you're a full blown audio company and and having even your amplifiers. It's um, I, I'm very happy I, with the with the um, Soundbase Pro that I have. It's fantastic. And a little nod yeah. here. Oh, I, look at that I, little uh, cover yeah. story love there. Yeah, the sound well, and vision. And it's like what that come in last month or whatever. I took a picture of it for today, but I'm like I have the Soundbase Pro that's running proudly running our speakers in my living room. And when this edition, this sound and vision came in the mail, I was like, I think this is the first time a product that I owned in my house was on the cover. <laughs> no, like, not like something was on the cover and I wanted to go get it. I'm like, wait a minute, I already have this and it's on the cover. So congratulations to you guys. And uh, congratulations to me for owning such a fine piece of product. <laughs> Good job. <laughs> well, congrats to you. I mean, we appreciate everything you guys are doing to stoke passion uh, for the world of audio and home theater. You know, it's it's close to hearts. We, you know, you, you can ask anyone at SVS. We're all obsessed with this kind of stuff. This is why I talk so uh, fervently about, uh, you know, animal sounds and, and earth sounds and things like that, because like, <laughs> I'm always looking for that next thing whether it's home theater or music. Um, and then, you know, with, with these new products, we can just get that much more out of it. So uh, we're just really uh, grateful that you guys had us on and uh, hopefully uh, somebody learned something uh, in the, in the process. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And um, Nick, you and I are going to be talking soon because I have to get you Smith and Larry together for a takeover Tuesday. And I want <laughs> Larry to tell me scenes. I want Smith to tell me what goes into doing Like, how do we get these free? How do we do all this? I mean, and we, we're going to need more than an hour. Guaranteed. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. When, yeah, when you go have, on uh, DJ uh, show, it's like Gilligan's Island. It's a three hour tour. <laughs> huh. or I was a part of the 24 hour. I still don't know how you pulled that off. Like that is just insanity to me to do a 24 hour broadcast, but kudos to you, man. That is uh that is Thank a, you. a true act of passion. No, oh, it's all of you guys. It, it went by like that. All I got to do is just keep talking, just like you guys. Steve knows. I just, <laughs> I just keep, I just keep replying to you guys. That's it. So, and thank that, you very that's the much. Thing, After twenty four hours, I had to tell DJ to stop. <laughs> <laughs> he was still going. He was he still going. <laughs> he did. Mm. Well, just to Come say, on, we will be blast. at Axpona. I saw a comment from Mike. Yes. Uh, Mike, I've met him before. He's a phenomenal dude. Uh, hopefully, I'll get yep. to see him out there in uh, Schaumburg, Illinois. So we'll be there. We'll be at the Home Entertainment Show in Costa Mesa uh, later in June. And we'll also be at M-Wave uh, out in uh, Kansas City out yep. in June as well. So, uh, Oh, let me know when you're out in Costa Mesa. That's not too far from me. Are. I can meet you guys. Absolutely. I should be at That's, Axpona. Uh, be, uh, I'm going to be at M-Wave. Uh, I'll drop you a note. Yeah. Okay. Can't wait Perfect. to see all you guys. Yeah. My, my listeners keep telling me, uh, VJ, I think it was earlier in the chat, met you out in Colorado, Nick, uh, people mm -hmm. talking about that. I, I, where was it? And then we've got Terry Noonan 
mentioning first time see Aaron Braden talking a simply a simple special moment for me legends so <laughs> talk about a letdown right that's yeah. what those guys look yeah. like <laughs> sure well it, it kind people of ask us you've been on my show so many times we did this a month a couple months ago it's like come on terry where you been buddy <laughs> uh, no that's good um guys thank you very much uh nick smith awesome can't wait to i honestly can't wait to have you back because i could just keep on going um but everybody's busy except me i guess at least right now <laughs> at the moment <laughs> well, well Raiden and i still have dinner coming up here it's... All, right, all right guys it's, is everybody it's a pleasure. out now we're, like because everybody went long so we're good everybody's out thank you everybody in the chat chat was awesome chat is I, they carry on their conversations thank you everybody thank you ara for setting this all up uh brayden thank you for being on time that was awesome oh yeah it was close man <laughs> it was close steve and cheers, cheers thank guys you bourbon too. Like, and, this yeah, oh my true. pleasure cheers. guys enjoy yeah. have that after thanks dinner the rest of it cheers yeah, yeah. yeah. thanks guys <laughs> i will salute and what do you gotta do uh, where's the there we go go push play what he said Hey, Fred. This has been a Hey Fred production with theme music by Jeff Bernhardt and Throne Vault Productions.